Hi, good evening. Welcome to the Miller Theater uh, for our um, in-person talk with a frequent uh, guest and a, a, a good friend of Asia Society, um, Pra Khanna, uh, global strategist advisor and founder of Climate Alpha and Future Map. And we, I, as I recall, this one probably will be at least third or fourth visit, in-person uh, visit for Parak here in Hong Kong, and we're delighted uh, that he is he has come back, and this time with his his family. So um, it's funny that that uh, uh, we you know today Parak got com you know compared to um, Taylor Swift uh, because Taylor, you've, many of you know, and then we've talked about this with some friends. He is she's touring in Asia, and I think she's only making stops in Australia and Singapore, and uh, so we don't get. Taylor Swift, but we get Parak Hana. So we're really proud that we have Parak with us in person, live at Asia Society. So I think uh, um, uh, his children should be very proud. And I think, you know, when you do take uh, Azar to Taylor Swift, you can, you, you're up there with Taylor. Um, but we're really delighted that today we can bring uh, um, this program. In fact, it was about a year ago I saw Parak in person when I was visiting uh, San Francisco and, and her. Um, kind of a version of this talk, I guess, with the book has come out. So the book is available in the back. We have uh, about 20 copies. Feel free to grab a copy. If you're a member, you get a discount. And uh, so I think tonight's talk is going to be based about the book, but uh, we're really delighted. And I'm um, really happy that um, uh, Asia 21, uh, uh, Diana David, founder of Future Proof Lab, is going to be helping us moderate to, uh, to this evening's uh, program. And uh, and I welcome all of you. Um, I Usually this time of the year, people are gone, but this year, uh, maybe we're suffering a bit of post-COVID, uh, people are still around. And we're going to be bringing some great programs, uh, even in July and August. And uh, so we look forward to um, welcome you uh, all summer long. And also, we have a lot of exciting plans ahead for the fall, and, and we look forward to uh, having you joining us for the program. We're going to continue probably in the, in the future also some uh, hybrid programs, but I think we are, it's nothing beats an in-person uh, program uh, like tonight. And uh, with that, I'm just going to turn it over uh, to our two, uh, two speakers and get the tonight's program started. And again, book is available in the back, and, uh, and I'll come back and, and, uh, and later on to, to close the program. So All right, great to be here. And um, can I call you Pepe? <laughs> sure. um, so as I was thinking about the, really we're gonna talk about your, your book, Move, how people are moving for a better future. And um, I think it's fascinating because I think about the future of work. I think about um, you know where people are going. Both you and I have moved from around a lot I would say, and now in Asia. Um, and you're no stranger to epic migrations yourself on the personal front because uh, you tried to take your two children from the port to the peak, actually in 34 degree heat. So, um <laughs> oh, tomorrow morning. Okay, Zara Zubin, I, I look forward to seeing how that goes. Um, but what everybody wanted to know, in fact, just prior to this, uh, and which we talked about is really, where will you be in 2050? So let that sink in when you think about it. Uh, somebody was saying, I want to know where I, I should be. Right. So that's the sort of initial premise of your book. What have you found out or what kind of reaction have you gotten since it's launched? Where do people want to be? Where do you suggest they go? That is such a great question um, because because the distance is so far in time, 2050, merely asking the question, where will you be, becomes rhetorical because no one has thought through the answer. And so it immediately becomes the normative, you know, where should I be, please tell me. And uh, that's in some ways, like a lot of my writing, it, it is a blend of the analytical and the prescriptive. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. I first want to say thank you, Diana, <laughs> for, for being here this evening and for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you've got three three kids who are all still at home until uh, they sequentially- Who would never walk up <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to the peak. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, and to Alice and of course the Age Society. This is this is now um, I think I'm ticking an important box this evening because this had I think been the only room in the Age Society that I've not had the privilege of speaking in. So now I get to say I've been in the Miller uh, Room and Theater uh, as well. So it's a real pleasure. And of course the Age Society is literally pretty intimate to my identity. My first job out of college was at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in New York on Park Avenue, which is two blocks away from the Asian Society. That job was, um, I took that job right after the India-Pakistan nuclear tests. And so one of the first things that we were doing was a joint study between the CFR and the Asian Society on strategy towards South Asia and a nuclear South Asia. And I got to interface with legends like Frank Wisner, who's uh, obviously a former US ambassador to India, who's such an important part of the modern story of the Asia Society's institution. Done m quite a few book launches of the Asia Society, including appropriately my Asia book, which was the, the previous one a couple of years ago. Um, had, the, had the New York Museum's schedule socially not been so overbooked um, in, um, in 2007, 2008, uh, my wife and I would have had our wedding there, uh, but it's a very popular destination or lo location for, for glamorous weddings, too. Uh, so really, I, I adore this uh, institution, so I'm really delighted to be able to come back. And of course, nothing like doing it in person with all of you this evening, so, so thank you. Um, so a few words back, back on the topic. Um, Where Will You Live in 2050 was the title of a very short article that a uh, very close friend and collaborator of mine, Greg Lindsay, a journalist and urbanist, um, wrote in 2010, 13 years ago. Um, and I can't remember who gets credit for the title, so I'm sure it was him. Uh, but the, the seed was planted then for what became this book. But fundamentally, this is a book, like all my others, about geography. And so the where, where will you have where? And it's not that people take where for granted, it's just that they take the definition of geography for granted. Geography, when I say geography, you think of natural geography, you think of the earth. And, and you're not wrong. It's just that there's only, that's only one layer of geography. But there's really four layers of geography. The natural geography is one, the political geography is another, which is really the geography that we default to on our maps. Right? Almost 99% of all maps that hang on most walls and most offices and most of the world will emphasize political borders to the detriment of other lines on the map. The third layer is economic geography, functional geography, connectivity, infrastructure, supply chains. And then the fourth layer is human geography. So this book is explicitly, and, I, and I, it's an itch I've wanted to scratch for the longest time, is human geography. Now, human geography is a subject unto itself. It's not an obscure niche of geography. It is the, in America, it's the fastest growing a AP course, for example. You know, two, three hundred thousand American kids take AP human geography. Um, it's, you know, it's got vast textbooks devoted to it now and so on and so forth. So I explicitly wanted to give my take on this field of human geography, that missing fourth layer that, again, we just take for granted. Why? Because we presume that where we are is where we were meant to be. It's where we've always been. Why should it change? We belong in these, you know, notionally natural ethnographic communities. And sure, lots of people are not necessarily happy within those constructs and confines. And, you know, the percentage of the human population, however, who are migrants is still a relatively small percentage, you know, travelers for the privileged and so on and so forth. And I wanted to contest pretty much all of that and say, well, if you go back, you know, 100,000 years, migration has continuously increased and ballooned in volume. Uh, yes, as a percentage of the human population, which is, of course, quadrupled in the past century, it remains constant, but the absolute number is staggering. But most importantly, the causes of migration, if you go back 100,000 years, whether it is wars, genocides, expulsions, whether it is climate change, whether it is demographic imbalances, I mean, I mean the gap between old and young and shortages in labor markets, whether it is um, uh, the search for a better life, economic opportunity, you name it. Pick anything that has ever caused migration ever in all of human history and juice it all up with steroids, and that's today. So how could one, anyone possibly argue that the map of the future, human geography, will actually look like today? And in particular, COVID was turned out to be a blessing in disguise for me because um, you always want to create a bit of tension and, and argument in a way when you're putting a book out, and the book was finished in 2020. And people are like, oh, it's the great lockdown. 
you'll never move again. No one will ever travel again. This is the end of every end of globalization, end of migration. And here I am putting the f you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on a book that it argues the exact complete and total opposite. And I'm pleased to say I've been totally vindicated in not in 20 years span, but in literally two years. Because here we are, 2022, migration and international border crossings and everything uh, exceeded 2019. And 2019 was by far the record year in all of human history for people crossing borders. So it tells you something about the resilience of mobility and our desire to be mobile and our need to be mobile and the inevitability of us being mobile because never have the demographic imbalances been wider on earth, never have there been more old people in countries without young people and more young people who don't have work and therefore want to move to older countries that have money. Never has climate change, well not in the last 12,000 years, has climate change been so acute. 12,000 years, by the way, is ago is when the last ice age retreated, right? So climate hasn't necessarily been a huge factor. We've had sedentary civilizations for the last 7,000 years-ish, right? Suddenly climate change, and then of course politics. You know, there are at least eight conflicts raging around the world or, or, or ge geographic origins of at least one million political uh, migrants, uh, refugees, and asylum seekers right now in the world. Um, so any way you slice it, people are going to move, voluntary, involuntary across the world. And uh, so that's the setup. That's, you know, the book is teasing all of that through. And I'll, I'll pause now, but Asia is, of course, a huge, huge, huge part of the story. And this is where th this book is really a sequel to Connectography, which was about functional geography five, six years ago. But the ways in which it's a sequel to, to The Future is Asian is simply because if you're going to write about human geography, we exist in a time when the majority of people on Earth are Asians in Asia. And that's always going to be true, right? Not only is it true now today as a fact, but given that fertility rates are plummeting all over the planet, you're left with a world in which the further you look in the future, the more demographically Asian the world becomes. And therefore, you know, sort of dot, 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 um, you know, the future of, in so many ways, the future of human geography is the future of Asian humans. And that's the question we should continue to, to discuss. Well, let's dive in um, because I think that uh, there's a lot of headlines about, okay, uh, India is going to, to double in population over the next couple of decades. China is on its way to um, maybe having its population. And uh, by some accounts, labor costs in China have gone up 15x, whereas the actual growth has been less than 15. So how are all these, I mean, India and China are the big elephants in the room, but then we have so many other smaller, high growth places like Indonesia, et cetera, Vietnam coming up. Like what is just hiving off Asia, the picture of migration and moving? So there's the Asian demographics in and of themselves, and then there's mobility of Asians within Asia and out of Asia. And I think both of those are equally important. So the just the Asian demographics are striking. I mean, what's wh I think over the last uh, six months since the United Nations made multiple rolling announcements about India's population exceeding China's. You know, the key attributes of that, characteristics that are that are important to, to highlight are even more salient, of course, the fact that India's median age is so much younger than China's, right? It's a billion people here, a billion people there, you know, close enough. What matters is that, the, is that India's median age is 15 years younger than China. You know, that makes really a huge difference. And of course, it's much poorer, labor costs are cheaper. You also have just geopolitical dynamics, what the White House calls de-risking and so forth. So you've got the flow of supply chains and investment you know, into the uh, you know, poor, younger countries of the rest of Asia. ASEAN alone is 700 million people. So that's you know, more people than, than Europe has. One of the things I always have to clarify about China is that you know, in, in the West, China is just viewed as an aging story. And what people don't understand is that when you have, I think that people just don't understand what five billion people means, unless you've lived in Asia the way all of us do. I, I honestly, even as, as you know, coming from America or from Europe, five billion is just a number. And I found this in years of kind of you know, talking about this issue whenever I return to America or Europe. They just don't understand how big a number five billion is. They just cannot even wrap their heads. It's just, it just, they say it, it's literally in one ear and out the other, right? Because the entire population of the rest of the planet is less 
than just what we have in the in a radius of Hong Kong. And so if you've grown up in even in New York or London or you know uh, wherever, you literally you literally do not get it. And I want to be clear, it's a psychological just you know mismatch. And so the reason this is important as a backdrop is people look at China and say it's an aging story. It's like, hold on. By the definition of median age, China still has more young people than all of Europe has human beings. So you can't just write off China just because it has a 4 2 one age structure and other kinds of things. It still has a huge number of working age people. It still has enormous demographic, economic, productive momentum. So that's an important, in a way, kind of um, lens into looking at all of Asia because you have so many people in all ages of the spectrum and you do have growing mobility, right? You do have a lot more Asians filling labor shortages in other Asian countries. I would argue not enough, right? When you look at bilateral migration agreements uh, between Asian countries like Japan, you know, sourcing nurses and, you know, construction workers, right? It'll take, you know, a couple, you know, tens of thousands of nurses from the Philippines and tens of thousands of construction workers from Nepal and so forth. But everyone knows that Japan needs literally an order of magnitude more than that in terms of migrants to fill its labor shortages. What many people don't know, that, but everyone in this room does, is that China, of course, needs to import people, <laughs> right, to fit certain segments uh, and uh, of its labor. I, yeah. And this <laughs> is the thing. So the operative, really one of the key operative principles of this book is what I call the war for young talent, right? In a world where wealthy societies are also aging and don't have any young people anymore, not nearly enough, they have to import young people, even if they have large populations, right? America has a large population, but it has a huge labor shortage. Yesterday's front page news in uh, several papers was that TS TSMC, which is building more semiconductor plants in the United States, can't find enough skilled workers. So it's flying in Taiwanese to speed up the construction of a semiconductor plant in the United States, right? So it's not about the number, it's about the skills and the matching and the professions and so forth. Countries that need nurses and physiotherapists don't just suddenly have on hand, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of physiotherapists, right? And in Germany, they've already pretty much exploited, for lack of a better word, every marginal surplus Ukrainian, Bulgarian, uh, Belarusian uh, nurse they can find. You have elderly Eastern European women taking care of elderly Germans to the point of utter exhaustion and where it's become a major legal issue about the exploitation of fellow European labor in Europe. There is no choice but to import lots of Asians. So a uh, very good friend of mine who uh, stepped down recently from the German parliament, uh, of course, went into private equity, and uh, as one does. And uh, what's his business? Training Indians uh, in India in you know, a bit of German babble enough to get by in uh, Bangalore, putting on planes, fly into Germany, farm them out to hospitals, right? Ditto in the Philippines. So, and this is important. So you have the war for young talent in which every country is realizing you either have young people or your economy is starving of labor, which is, puts on its head the whole idea of xenophobic populist nationalist immigration policy, which again exists. You have your prime minister of Italy and all these others who talk a tall game, anti-migrant, Migrant, but migration numbers, I mean, I, I always look at facts and what people are doing, what countries are doing, not what politicians are saying. And if you look at Italy, if you look at Britain, right? I mean, since Brexit and with COVID, you know, as an exception, immigration has gone through the roof, right? Canada is like overshot by, by more than 100% its own very ambitious migration target, <laughs> right? One million new migrants entered Canada last year and their target was like 400, 450,000. Barry, maybe you know the figures, <laughs> but you're right. There you go, see? And oh, happy Canada Day, <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so um, yeah, so anyway, the, the fact, so anyway, so it's not just a war for young talent, it's actually young Asians. So one thing that um, when I try to simplify or crystallize ideas, I say, so does this all mean by the you know, logic by just simple deductive logic, the future of humanity, like the future of human species, the kind of topic that of course people will write large philosophical tomes about. I have a much more prosaic answer to the future of humanity. It's Asian youth, like in a literal sense, just Asian youth. When you want to talk about the future of humanity, yeah, of course you can talk about technology and, and ideas and religion and ethics. Actually the future of humanity is Asian youth, right? Whatever Asian youth want, is what the future of the human species is going to look like and do, right? That, that's how severe the imbalances 
globally demographically. And so what about things like youth unemployment in China then? Yeah. That, what is that? What's not working? I, I've wrestled with that. Well, so youth unemployment in China, again, even that you would want to break down into cities versus rural and, you know, sort of um, uh, the skills. The air, mobility the, problem. mobility <laughs> thing. Well, no, th that's too bad. But like sort of, you know, the areas where if you have a cyclical downturn, you know, and you have uh, – you know, sort of almost uh, overeducated people in a certain area, that's going to be a structural issue for a while. Other countries have had that for a long time, like Spain, you know, for example, and others. Um, I don't know what, what's how specifically they will solve it. I would simply attribute to China a greater capacity to, you know, redistribute labor and to compensate it and to retrain it to, um, you know, and, and so forth than other countries, right, where where structural becomes systemic, right? It, and that's Europe. Europe's problem is that, like, you can't, you can't actually foresee the uh, high youth unemployment or underemployment in France. They referred more to it as that, in um, and in Spain, uh, as being resolved, like ever, right? Whereas in China, you can imagine them finding ways to to resolve it. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what people do. I, I toy with this in the, in the book where I talk about those who are less educated than the ones you're talking about. Kind of being, you know, again, redistributed nationally around large infrastructure projects and other kinds of things. Uh, obviously, the services sector, especially around elderly care and so forth, is going to require a lot more workers. So just forcing people to do the things that they may not have been educated to do, but that society needs. And then obviously finding the right language and campaigns to make those the patriotic duty <laughs> and so on and so forth. Again, none of this stuff is going to happen in France and Germany and Spain, right? It's just not going to happen. Germany is pretty interesting, though, because, of course, they've absorbed the, the um, again, involuntarily received number of uh, refugees and asylum seekers from Syria and from Ukraine since 2015, 2016 by, mil by the millions. They've been absorbed in the labor force. But again, that's Germany. They're, they're, they, have, they have capacity. They have competence. <laughs> they have a lot of the things that, that some of their neighboring countries lack. So one of the things that you said, you know, in, in my experience, there is to a certain extent, the great passport scramble, right. where people are you know, saying, OK, I'm going to get the Portugal passport, yeah. and then Brexit. People were thinking, oh, no, I have a UK passport, but now that we're in Brexit, I don't have yeah. access, or my kids don't have access. But you said something on our prep call, and you said, you know, it's the first time ever that passports, you know, what passport you hold doesn't make a difference. Well, so passports, right, didn't exist so in does? a meaningful way until. That's my way question. Until, like, what uh, does sk make skills? In one word, so the past, the new passport is skills, and the reason is is m many many reasons. So one is that more and more passports formally have more access to more countries. That's a quantifiable statement because if you look at all of these passport rankings over that used to be, if you had an Indian passport, you can't go anywhere. You know, even if you had a Saudi passport, you can't go anywhere. If you had a, a whole bunch of countries' passports, so. Even the middle, the, take, just take the middle income countries where the, you used to be able to go, mi just take middle income populous countries, right? So, you know, your Indonesias and your Brazils and, and whatnot, Egypts and whatnot. Like, you know, those countries, citizens could go to like 20 countries without a visa, which is pretty much nowhere. Even those countries today can go to like, you know, 50, 60, 70 countries without a visa, A. B, on the demand side, you've got the whole northern hemispheric OECD world saying, we need young people, we'll take them, um, you know, just, just come if you can, you know. Again, the relaxation of standards, again, very, very formally. So, again, you can measure this. You used to need to pay, if you were from a South Asian country and you wanted to migrate to Britain, you'd have to pay a security bond, money that you did not have, right, to be clear. Your family could not afford. It was a deterrent, right, these rules pay a security bond, demonstrate proof of employment, like are you guaranteed a job, all of your education certifications. These are fairly almost insurmountable obstacles. They've all been scrapped. Not because Prime Minister Modi flew to Britain and demanded it, because Britain has labor shortages. Right? They're just like, you know what, to hell with that requirement. That forget it, wave it, wave it, forget it. Right? Then there's the competition among countries, and then there's the COVID effect where so many, the, we, di we accelerated the digitization of applying to migrate to places, right? You know, uh, when I first went to Vietnam as like a backpacker, I don't know how many decades ago, I remember going to an embassy and waiting online. And I paid like $300 for like a fast track thing. And this was a long time ago, that was a lot of money. Um, who, 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 get, who needs a visa to go to Vietnam? Like the, most young people alive today can't even imagine needing to get a visa for, for anywhere. So the new passport is skills. 
and if you end up in Canada being a shining example, you go on the uh, you go on the um, you know whatever the government portal is to apply. You just say you know uh, I'm from you know Argentina and I'm 21 years old and here's my high school certificate or I have some vocational degree and like you know here's a screenshot of my bank account like whatever you're in right. Um, and if you're young, I, I write about this in the book. It's like it's super um, uh, ageist. Like, but in like a reverse ageism. So young people get way more points than old people. So when I, I went through the Canadian thing just for my research, um, and I got like, I don't know, like 12 points. Like what? <laughs> you know, like, like that's kind of, li- you know, like, but it, it, you know, so I'm like. Everybody I'm, in this room is going to do it after yeah, this. I can yeah, yeah go, go try it out. I was like, oh, because I'm, I'm over 40, you know, and uh, whereas if you're 20, you get double the points right away. So they want young people. Wha- that's very intelligent because as we know, no matter, again, no matter what populist politicians say, there, I mean, how many reams, how many studies have been published on this? Young migrants don't mooch off the system for decades. They contribute in massively, right, both in labor and, and as taxpayers well before they ever draw upon the system because they're healthy, right, and they're savers and they're consumers. So you can't talk to it. And, and so the, the policymakers, the real policymakers, the, the not, not, the, not the grifting politicians who run <laughs> most, you know, Anglophone countries these days, the, the people who make the policy know better. They know they're completely... So again, you know, Brexit happened and COVID happened and Britain had, didn't have nurses for the NHS. It didn't have people to pick apples in the orchards. So they flew them in from Uzbekistan, right? So I've got Uzbek friends who were telling me about this. They're like, you know, plane loads of Uzbeks are flying <laughs> to London and going and getting paid like wads of cash and British pounds to go spend a week picking apples and then they fly home because no Brit wanted to go pick apples, right? But meanwhile, Liz Truss, who you may remember for the four minutes that she was prime minister of the UK, right? One of her campaign things, she went up on stage, she's like, mm, British apples. Do you guys remember this? This became this, this hideous meme on social media. So that's how forgettable she was. But she was like, you know, mm, but we have to revive the British economy, mm, British apples. She brought an apple on stage. No, none of you remember this? You don't need to follow politics to have seen this. This was just so bad by, by the standards of any political trope. Um, but who picked those apples to revive the British economy? It was like, you know, Uzbeks, <laughs> right? So there's no way around the need. There's no way around the demand. So whatever skill, you, if you can name what that skill is, right, you're, there's a country that wants you. And, and this is why I'm actually ultimately hopeful because there's never been a time better time to be young because there's lots of rich old countries that are desperate for young people. And if you have some skill, some country wants you. And if you want to get out of that country that you're in, you know, th- there is a way, right? There, there's a subset of people, which is the exact opposite of the spectrum that you were initially talking about, which is, of course, those who are trapped. And as you know, a student of geography, I'm very mindful. And I, I do this kind of very simple back of the envelope arithmetic in the beginning of the book. I'm like, there are 4 billion people who are never going to leave the country, maybe even 5 billion people who will never, ever, ever leave. They are trapped, and I feel really sorry for them, potentially, unless they're happy where they are. And it's most of the population of South America, and it's most of the population of Africa, and it's many Indians in India, and many Indonesians in Indonesia, and many Egyptians in Egypt. They will literally never, ever leave their country. And things are not going so great in many of those countries. And I add up the populations of those countries, and I say, I hope that these countries that we can help them and they can help themselves, but their people are probably not going to go anywhere. So I'm not, Im- you know, I'm not. Im- it's like the know. great mobility divide. That right. digital divide yeah. has become the mobility. divide. But there are divide. four billion people who are absolutely candidates to move, and most of them are young, and a lot of them are Asian. And I'm going to focus the future story on them because they are the ones who are going to make or break the future of many countries. Right, as they vote with their feet, they determine the winners and losers. Right. So I, I came up with a very simple binary conclusion in this book. If your country is attracting young people, you will be fine in the future. You will solve whatever problem is thrown your way, right? If your country is losing young people, you are finished. End of story. Full stop. Because unlike any other period of time in the last, say, you know, 300 years, when every generation was succeeded by a larger generation, that's not happening anymore. That has stopped, right? The human species has stopped reproducing at the rate that it used to. And therefore, you cannot, you literally cannot say that it's okay if we are exporting people, we're just producing more babies, because you're not. There's only one country in the world that exports a lot of people and still has a lot of people, and that's India. The only exception, the only gravity-defying demographic. But if you're not India, 
and you're losing people, you really need to start thinking really hard about your economic model. Thank God for AI. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could ask you and do have about six more questions, but I want to open it up to people from the audience because this is an opportunity for you to ask any questions that might be on your mind. Okay. Um, do we have a microphone so I don't have to dive headlong <laughs> off the stage? Jason. So Japan comes to mind when you talk about an older population and being desperate for young people, but at the same time, not very open to immigration. Like, but it's also a huge and important economy. So yeah. like, where, where does that fit into your whole idea of, of how this is changing the world? Yeah. It's, th it's that Japan is changing, but not enough. So the latest data, this is you know reported in the Nikkei just last week. They made a front page story out of it. Um, you know, there's 2.7 million foreign workers in Japan. So basically, in the you know whatever the 7,000 years of recorded Japanese history, <laughs> there've never been 2.7 million non-Japanese people on the islands of Japan. There are today, right now, as we speak. So there's some progress, obviously. They didn't get there by accident. It's hard to get to Japan by accident, <laughs> right? So they're there for a reason, and they're documented, they're codified, they're working in the economy. You know, Japan needs them and wants them. It's just that they need five, 10 million, right, probably. And uh, I don't know if it'll get to that. I, I know the politicians and the businesses and the efforts that are being made to rewrite certain legislation and to change certain you know policies and rules and regulations to enable more inbound migrants, uh, whether it's at, you know, at, at every level, literally at every single level. It's the nurses and the construction workers, and it's this, it's the technology um, uh, and finance and, and everything. So, and it's a very attractive place to be, you know, a very livable place. So I think that even if it's still a drop in the bucket, you know, other than wards of Tokyo where you see tons and tons of, you know, foreigners that, that feel very cosmopolitan, but you're starting to see, I mean, I, I actually have the, the data in the book. E every single prefecture, believe it or not, of Japan has a growing foreign population, even ones that none of us could, could name. Um, so it's happening, and this is all part of the kind of, um, the, the, the crude word I use in the book a lot is mongrelization. You know, in every society is becoming kind of just more, more diluted than it ever thought it would be, faster than it ever thought it would be. And that may well eventually even happen to Japan. You have to look pretty far into the future, but you know, in, in a nation. But it, you know, here's the thing: there's nothing so teleological that it that even even if it's the right thing for Japan to do because it needs to do it from an economic standpoint and otherwise. That doesn't mean it will. Lots of countries also make mistakes or don't do things well enough. So I mean, you know, Russia. I can't save Russia from demographic implosion, right? It's been happening literally for decades and decades, and it's accelerated since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's accelerated um, due to everything they've done wrong in the last 30 years, which is an uh, astounding amount, <laughs> right? From alcoholism to invading Ukraine, right? And now losing capable young men who are trying to, uh, who are escaping uh, conscription. Not every country is gonna do it right. Like I said, there's a very binary situation here. I know what the winning countries are doing, and I know what the losing countries are, are doing. Japan is not way over here on the winning side, like Canada, right? Canada's here, and there's some other countries that are that are here. Japan's, you know, like somewhere close to the middle. So I can't guarantee that they'll do enough, in, enact enough reforms, and attract enough migrants and assimilate them. It's not just oh wow they're here, to assimilate them, right? And this is a huge thematic um, that I've lived through in, in many different places. Many of you have as well. But it's it, there's a point. The number getting them in is the easy part, right? You you the assimilation policy, which is itself, by the way, uh, I think it's a separate topic. But it's a huge part of the future definition of what is um, what is it, the economy. What do we do? What do we pay people for? What do we value, right? Um, because training people to be productive members of your society and feel and, and make it their home is itself the economy it's almost should needs to be part of the purpose not just a sunk cost that the public sector has to pay in order to subsidize a um, kind of you know a humanitarian you know objective of bringing in foreigners no it has to be much much more than that right so integration and assimilation is itself um, a major economic value add and, and that, that's actually very true but making that leap you know um, 
even from the empirical side into policy and, and, the, and the, the narrative in politics, wow, most countries are a long way away. Uh, again, only Canada, they explicitly say it, they do it, the people believe it. it. It actually should follow that logic, but most countries don't have rational, you know, political systems. So, thank you, Parab. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, how you see, you know, AI, robotics, uh, autonomous technology, in terms of displacing jobs and therefore in terms of migration flows, um, you know, to what extent would that, you know, kind of disrupt the kind of historical trends that you've, you've laid out? Well, it wouldn't, it's part of them. So one of the, one of the things I look at is labor migration in the 20th century, which is uh, the, the be so whether it's the search for economic opportunity uh, internationally or labor migration with new industrial, industrial diversification domestically, that accounts for most human migration in the 20th century, even in the same century that had World War II and the partition of India and Pakistan and the Chinese Civil War. That same century, way more migration was actually just people searching for a better life, and that, that's a good thing. And a lot of that does relate to technology as well. And so, but now, more broadly, I would say there's like the positive technological externalities and like the negative. The, the, the negative would be well, you have industrial displacement. You've had, obviously, um, you know, uh, the deindustrialization of America's Rust Belt, lots of jobs, obviously, going to Asia and so on. And those people had to move, right? So your factory closes down, you move. It's happened within China. It's happened in America. It happens everywhere. You had the when, – when the, when the financial crisis hit Europe, right, 2009, 2010, you had a south-to-north migration. You had Italians and Greeks – moving northward, and that was before the Syrians and the Ukrainians, it was obviously not spoken about in the same, you know, racial tones, but Germans were full of anger, like, you know, what are all these Greeks and Italians doing, you know? Uh, they, Switzerland actually considered, um, you know, closing its borders, uh, you know, in certain, it has obviously legal restrictions on when and when it can't do that, but they considered a national security crisis, right? Um, then, then there's a the positive side, which is, wow, we all get to work from home now because <laughs> of you know, remote work and people can even de-urbanize. The last couple of years, or the first two years since the 1930s, when the percentage of the U.S. population that, doesn't, that lives in rural areas increased, it increased by 0.3%, which is not a lot, but the fact that it happened at all shows that enough people are sell, you know, kind of you know, working in the services economy earning enough and feel stable enough in their jobs that they don't feel that if they lost their job, they need to be in a city to network and hand their CV out again door to door, that they're saying, oh, I'm going to go live in a, in a nice bucolic suburban, exurban area, country home, whatever. But I would consider that generally a, a Western phenomenon because in Asia, the, the, the gap in the quality of life and in income and services, education, healthcare, access to everything is so much higher in cities than in second tier areas that Asians will continue to flock into cities for a long, long time. So that's part of the answer. So I mean, but I, th I think the, the bigger answer is that I guess as the percentage of the population um, that is that works in the services economy grows, the services economy is primarily what humans do for other humans, right? Obviously, technology is a huge component of it, but we also sell more things to each other as we get richer, right? So I think that by and large, the services economy is, yes, it is a place where people are getting displaced. So lawyers, you know, paralegals, you know, aren't needed. Even some doctors aren't needed and all these kinds of things. But again, does the medical profession need more humans? Yeah, it really does, right? So part of it is like, on paper, yes, technology could you know, in an academic sense, hypothetically erase X number of jobs. But the fact is that actually jobs are created by what you're willing to pay for a job, right? I mean, America needs more teachers. If you just paid more people, paid teachers higher wages, more people would become teachers, right? And you wouldn't eliminate them just because people can do Khan Academy classes, right? So I think it ultimately, despite all the rapid technological innovation that I'm equally astounded by, I think the solution is ultimately a public policy one, which is, you know, and an economic one, what are you willing to pay people enough to do? And then they'll do it, and you'll create those jobs. All right, any other questions? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the insights. Thank you as well for the questions. Really great uh, and very insightful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patricia, and I have actually a very um, specific question for the first part that you have been answering there as well, touching base on the public sector. <coughs> what role can actually the private sector play in order to help the uh, improve the reskilling, upskilling part? I know that there are a lot of private sectors or a lot of organizations like Microsoft or like others that are already engaged in the MIC tech yep. part. So they are really focused on it. But what else and what more can they do? And how can we bridge this gap? It's Especially a great that question. they do actually, yeah. the, that they are committed to the ESG um, yeah. regulations as well and uh, yeah. factors. I mean, more and more. You know, as a rule, right, the faster technology evolves, the less the public sector, generally speaking, is going to be able to keep pace, right? So it's going to rely more and more on the private sector to shoulder that burden of training workers, upskilling them. And, you know, it's in education, it's called sorting and matching, you know, sorting graduates, matching them to professions. I call this um, economic master planning. You know, the, the term master planning generally applies like urban urban studies and, 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 and architecture and, and so forth, but really there's an economic master plan that countries have to have in which you think about, you think a few years ahead in technology, you think about what you want your foundational industries to be in your economy, you think about where, what skills the workers presently have and what they're being trained for in the educational system, you think about which companies can create jobs in those higher high-tech areas where the wages are going to be higher, and can they train them if the educational system is not doing so or do so in partnership with the educational system? Now, please count how many countries really have a genuine economic master plan that they execute relentlessly day in and day out and ensure that their pipeline of workers and students are even changing their training and what they're being trained for midstream to prepare for the industries that are going to be uh, ready to hire workers three, four years from now. You could count them on one hand, right? In fact, if I amputated a finger, you could still count it on one hand, right? And you know, it's places like Korea, you know, places like Switzerland, you know, very, very few countries have a viable, dynamic, you know, evolving economic master plan. Almost every other place is way behind. And so the private sector is crucial because it's not just what they do in one country. You know, you can Microsoft start. There's like a Starbucks Academy and a McDonald's Academy and a Microsoft Academy and every in America in particular because vocational training is so underemphasized. Um, every corporate, every big corporate, just assumes that employees are coming in without the requisite skills to do the job. Right? I mean, I mean, you know, I don't know. Say three out of ten are qualified already, you know, sort of on day one to do their job. So the in-house, you know, training is, is happening relentlessly. And uh, if that's the American way, that's the American way, that's the way they're going to solve the problem. In other countries, there'll be a lot more public sector involvement, public-private partnerships and so on. But every country's got to sort it out for themselves. But they, what they first and foremost have to do is to figure out what is my, my country's role in the global division of labor, in global supply chains, in global industries. What, what is our geography meant for? What are our people going to do? What is, their, what is their contribution to the global economy? And literally starting from that, from that m massive abstraction, reverse engineer the answers to those questions. And if you can't do it, uh, you're gonna have a lot of unemployed young people in your country. All right. Who are gonna leave <laughs> if you can, if they can. <laughs> yeah. Um, I all right, great, uh, wonderful insights. I like the new passport. <laughs> so skills is the new passport. Um, I, I wonder, there, what I understand is that the elderly population countries, they, they are usually also kind of attractive for, for young people because there's the money, there is work to do. Is there also a challenge in keeping uh, young talent? So you and I have, have lived probably both, most of our lives outside our own country. Right. And some countries we went to had a super reputation, but then we found out there are some negatives which are not, yeah. not uh, let's say, at least compliant with our expectations. So right. is there a challenge, oh yeah. and, and what can cu countries do to work on that? This is so fast. I'm glad you raised this question, Wolfgang. It's actually uh, pinning, pinning young people down is, uh, is one of the is a kind of 
uh, uh, one of the themes uh, in the book because I think young people are very different from our generation. You know, they, we, we presume that identity is kind of premised on some sense of national origin, ethnicity, inherited identity from your know, parents and grandparents. And young people think more horizontally about their identity. So, you know, what is my tribe, my community, people who think like me, it doesn't matter where they're from, right? And I'm not just making this up because I have cosmopolitan inclinations, like sociological research and surveys bear this out very, very clearly. It's not just a third culture kid thing. It's not just an expat thing. It's literally everywhere, you know? And so uh, this becomes an issue because young countries right now that are hot in terms of attracting talent, they just presume that, that you know, well, we're having our moment, and not just, not just the moment, people are gonna stay. And I've had these conversations with any number of governments where they say, well, you know, how do we turn these digital nomads into investors, right? Can we get them to buy real estate and so on? I'm like, no, they're not gonna do it. Young people don't wanna own real estate, right? They don't think of their future as being pinned down to one place. Even if you think that they've found the perfect place and they think they've found the perfect place, there's still a voice inside their head saying, well, there's lots of other places that might be just as good. Why would I, uh, you know, my, 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 my meager savings, why would I commit it to this place? Young people want access, they don't want ownership. They'd rather spend on access, right? Membership to, or you know, uh, multiple golden visas, right? Invest that money in a golden visa scheme here, or there, and, and eight other places. Your scramble uh, terminology covers not just buying a passport, but just buying access, right? So I can, I, I know uh, many, many, many hundreds of people that I've surveyed and spoken to who will never invest in real estate anytime soon, right? And it, again, it's not just a matter of waiting for them to mature and become like you know old old folks. Uh, it, it has to do with the fact that they don't have children. Young people don't have children, so if they don't have children, then the main reason why people in the baby boomer, Gen X generation ever settle down, stable employment was one reason. Well, there is no more stable employment. Uh, having children, well, they're not having children. And loyalty, national loyalty, but that's gone too. So everything that caused people in the boomer generation and Gen X to ever settle down in one place, those, those deep like anthropological factors and, eth and eth eth ethnic factors and social factors and political factors and economic factors and demographic factors, every single one of them that we take for granted, we just assume, if I, if, we, if I wasn't talking about this, we'd be saying, yeah, of course, young people, this is what they do, you, they, everyone's rebellious and then they get older and then they settle down and they get a job and they buy a house and they have a mortgage and they have children. We'd assume that this is like the arc of like demographic life. I, it only ever was for a very select like kind of a, you know, period of time, right? But that's gone, it's gone, it's over. It's not like a future prediction, it's already over. So you can't get young people. So the young people, even if you have the best digital nomad scheme, like look at you know, Portugal, you know, Portugal right now, which you mentioned earlier, Portugal, people are like, oh, I'm done with Portugal, right? Because they actually ended part of the scheme and then the, the, the geographies that were uh, designated for real estate investment have like been filled out. And now Greece is like the new Portugal. So it's like, oh, see a see a Portugal, I'm off to Greece. Look at Dubai, it's gangbusters, you know, Bali. I'll go to Bali for a while. I'll go to Tbilisi, Georgia, which is um, uh, uh, the, the, the city in, 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 in the country in the world that's had the most dramatic turnaround that I've seen in the last 25 years. It's like, you know, backpacker English is the lingua franca <laughs> of Tbilisi, Georgia, right? So young people are just gonna keep on doing this. And then the few that have children, if any of them do, will move to Berlin or Helsinki. And what I've noticed at Berlin and Helsinki is that these are two cities in particular that have figured out that when, I if a millennial has any kids at all, and they'll only just have one, they'll never have two. They, that's when they decide that they need to be in a place where at least someone has a kid, so their kid has someone to play with. And so, and I'm not making this up because I'm not, I'm not in this business anymore. Of like, it's, it's more that you can literally look at the cities in the world, and 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 actually, you'll love this. And in, in, you know, in Berlin, they call it the Kita Index. A kita is German for kindergarten, for like you know, <laughs> so so you can count whether or not the number of kitas is growing or shrinking. And in most places it's shrinking, but in Berlin it's growing. And in Helsinki it's growing because, and, it, and you can literally see advertising, the, the Finnish government, the government of Finland is taking ads out in English, in magazines, all over the world saying, raise your young family in Helsinki. 
come and do your digital nomad thing here. We want the really smart software engineering, jet set with a kid, good income, civilized, right? That's what they want. They're targeting exactly that. So you'll have these like melting pots of millennials that have exactly one kid. Well, I think that the private sector opportunity that I'm seeing is, you know, you may not be from, you know, American and stay there, et cetera, but you're still going to be traveling all the r around the world and say, oh, I have this brand affiliation. I went to Harvard or went to HKUST, like it travels with you, it yeah. confers access, or, you know, maybe you're an alumni of a prestigious firm. And so firms starting to say, oh, actually, like we can be part of your story and we can be part of the story after you leave as well. Um, I'm seeing, by the way, this is a hot business, not just relocation, but basically replicating uh, the experience. So there's these companies that have bought up whole bunches of properties, you could almost call them districts of towns in Portugal. And then they advertise a lot and young families move there and then they provide the schooling and then the housing and then you know the, the digital amenities and the lifestyle. And then after six months, you can actually move to their other location, which happens to be right near Florence. And after that, you can move to their next location, which is in Bali. And you can literally just move around this set of like, you know, lifestyle communities for digital nomads with or without kids, right? In a way, uh, you can pretty much do that forever. Yeah, they're doing it for older people too, thank goodness. <laughs> it's not all about the young. Another question right in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a question, Barrett? I do, thank you. I've got to ask how this change in human geography, how do you think it might affect political geography? And since you brought up Canada, right, Canada's population hit 40 million, um, which, okay, it's a growing country, but if climate-induced migration moves 10% of the U.S. population into Canada, you know, we got 30, 300, we got 35 million new Canadians. Is Canada really, Canada still, or are we just the 51st state? Right, that's just one example of how climate-induced migration might change political geography. I'm interested in your thoughts yeah. on Well, the, um, you know, the, there's there's two. Lo let's, let's start with the negative cases. It's something I talk about at the end of the book. It's a concept that doesn't yet exist in international law called vacant states. So the definition, the for legal definition of a state is that you must have a recognized recognize boundaries and a permanent resident population. And, and I foresee that there'll be territories in the world where people have just vacated fully, right? Because they're unlivable. Take like, you know, Yemen or, you know, Eritrea or various other countries that literally there's no water, like that's it. You know, close up shop, you're, you know, you're gone. Um, and that's the downside. So you will have, you know, climate migration already accounts for one third of total international migration, the stock of international migrants today, according to the IOM. Uh, international Organization of Migration, and that number is rising faster than political and economic uh, migrants. So I, I do think that it's going to be a, an ever-growing factor. It'll first change the complexion and the demographics of receiving countries, whether it's Canada, whether it's Kazakhstan, whether it's Germany. And by the way, the causes, of course, are ultimately tied together. You know, it's very, very hard. You know, we all know that the Syrian civil war was as much a, you know, climate-related event as a political event and economic event and so on and so forth. So let's just lump all these things together in many ways in terms of the outbound driver, the push factors. But the big example that I've wrestled with for, for, for almost like 20 years now around you know, climate change and demographics changing political geography is actually Russia. Because Russia has a declining indigenous population, which is a, a secular you know, kind of uh, a trend that's been underway for a long time, as, as I mentioned earlier. And inevitably, given the, its vastness, you know, largest country in the world, you know, and, and its desperate labor shortages, and, and of course, eventually, you do will have a post-Putin, you know, kind of uh, regime of some kind. Um, I can't imagine the 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 governance, you know, the de facto, not the de jure governance of Moscow and uh, the imperial mindset that it has but the de facto reality of life on the ground in many parts of Russia not being populated by a very diverse set of mostly you know, Asian peoples, whether they're Turkic or Asiatic or whatever the case may be. And I've, I've wrestled with that, written about it, built scenarios around that literally for, for a long, long time. And I just feel like that's more and more and more likely to be the case because, because everything in Russia is so much worse 
<laughs> than, than, than even I thought and even I've experienced. I've driven across Russia and I've spent a lot of time there. And it's so much worse than you think unless you spend time there. And what's happened with the Ukraine war, and, and, and I would actually date it to really 2014 in Crimea, uh, kind of Crimea 1 and everything that's happened in the last, uh, you know, almost decade really, is the, this Asianization of Russia from a geopolitical standpoint, from a diplomatic standpoint. Um, and, r and Russia is no longer, should no longer be thought of as Eastern Europe. Right. In multilateral bodies and in our own political minds, we think of Russia as Eastern Europe, right? Central and Eastern, e you know, it's, 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 it's literally codified that way in FIFA and the World Bank and the UN. In reality, for a geographer, Russia is North Asia. But I'm probably the only person you ever heard refer to Russia as North Asia, even though it is the entirety of North Asia. No geographer would ever disagree with what I just said. Every geographer says what I just said. But unless you're a geographer, it strikes you as like, what the hell is this guy saying? But in fact, Russia is North Asia, and Russia is going to have an Asia society chapter, I'm sure, <laughs> in some years in the near future. Because it is so utterly inevitable that in the 21st century, one of the big you know, psychogeographic shifts is going to be understanding that Russia is basically an Asian country um, with, obviously, European Slavic population concentrated in that quadrant of the country. But a climate is going to play a huge part of that. And, and prior to COVID and now subsequently, uh, uh, the, you know, Russia's warm relations with China, with India, and so forth continue, um, whether it's the oil trade, infrastructure investment, and so forth. And even demographically in the sense that you'll have more seasonal migrations into Russia to you know, apply economic trade and so on and so forth. So that's going to be one big story. Again, is it going to change like the exact lines on the map and, you know, where will there be a water war? You know, that, that can also be part of your question. That's going to be like kind of case by case. But another couple of tiny, tiny examples. One is, you know, the Near East. So you have scorching temperatures in Iran, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, right? So this this belt of countries in West Asia that are becoming increasingly unlivable uh, border on Eastern Anatolia, right? Eastern Turkey. And that region is immensely livable and verdant. And I've spent a lot of time there also, and, and there's a section of the book talking about it. I'm like, I cannot imagine that you will not have, which the population is almost vacant, right? Uh, Eastern Turkey has almost no people, even though it's like perfectly livable and, 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 uh, you know, um, and fertile. All the Turks have moved west. And I've witnessed this over 20 years of visiting that part of Eastern Turkey. I can't imagine that if you think about the climate future, Right. I'm not saying that borders won't exist. They, they do, right? But Turkey already is home to the largest number of political, uh, you know, migrants, uh, refugees of any country in the world already today. I can't imagine a future in which there aren't 50 million, five zero at least, Iranians and Syrians and Iraqis and Jordanians and Lebanese and others in that geography that today on a map is the sovereign geography of the Republic of Turkey. And it may still be the sovereign geography of the Republic of Turkey. It's just that the people there aren't Turkish, right? And I say the same thing in the book about Bulgaria. You know, Bulgaria is like a mini Russia, like everyone's leaving, right? But, but Bulgaria is only like 5 million people, and in the future there'll be 4 million, and then 3 million, and then 2 million. But if you've ever been to Bulgaria, well, it's a spectacularly beautiful, arable country, right? It's got forests, it's got rivers, it's got the Danube. It's like, why would you not want to be? So Bulgaria, the future of Bulgaria, I don't know what it'll be called on a map, I just know that the vast majority of people who live in that territory, <laughs> in those lo latitude and longitude coordinates, <laughs> presently known as Bulgaria, in 2050, they're just not going to be Bulgarian. There'll be plenty of people there because we will, we will resort ourselves into livable, sustainable geographies because we have a fight or flight instinct and you don't want to fight climate change, right? You will flee climate change and you'll wind up in those livable places. And so, you know, Canada, is just one of those places that I call a climate oasis. So, you know, a lot of the book is a geographic tour of kind of like my, you know, mapping out and identifying these climate oases, but to kind of maybe end where we started, it's not just climate. It's like, are you politically desirable? Are you culturally desirable? Are you assimilating people? Are there jobs for you when you get there, right? And maybe one last point about young people. Young people are looking at all of this. Young people are a lot smarter than we think. They, because they, the world, every country wants them. 
I, you've got to be 18 years old right now uh, to fully grasp this. But I, I talk to young people all the time, like, I can go to college in any one of these places, right? You know, I can get a job in any of these places. I can get a digital nomad visa in any of these country, uh, places, right? I'm being offered jobs here, 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 and here. That's, that's a, great, it's a great moment for them. So you're, it's, you've got to align everything. You've got to have the right climate, the right politics, the right labor market, um, you know, um, the right culture, all of those things. And that, to Wolfgang's question, that's going to change a lot because some places are going to you know, veer too far in one direction or the other. Then they'll lose people to the next cool spot. And maybe that's what the future is going to be, is this kind of you know, archipelago of, of interesting, livable, survivable places. Um, that's kind of where I'm kind of going with it in the end because I thought that it was going to be like a one-way ticket. You know, let me plot where 9 billion people will be in the year 2050, boom, produce a map, publish the book, done, move on. What I realized is that actually it's going to be this, it's not, it's, um, I should have just retitled the book in the end instead of move, moving, right? People will be moving. We're going to be more nomadic. And that's what we have been for the better part of 100,000 years. And I think a lot more people who can, who can afford to, right, with those caveats, those who can will remain, retain that mobility as optionality because we're all price takers. We can't control exactly what's going to happen everywhere. So we're just going to keep on moving to find the right place. Uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, as you said, it's hard to imagine 5 billion people. It's hard to imagine where we'll live in 2050. But if I look back and think about Russia, my first job was working for Henry Kissinger, and I still remember... 30 years ago, answering the phone, and CNN said, you know, the Soviet Union has just collapsed. We need a, we need a quote. <laughs> um, not for me, obviously, yeah. but, <laughs> it, you know, it's amazing that all the history and, and all the change that we've seen and witnessed in, in, those, uh, in that time. Do we have time for one more question, Alice? Sorry, we have here? Yep. Hi, thank you very much, Barak. Um, I was going to ask something similar to about climate change, but uh, basically I think uh, two things. One, what you said about Russia I think is very interesting because I think um, there should be more work done looking at the Eurasia phenomenon or the concept of Eurasia. I don't think enough is being done to study that. There, there are quite a, lot of a number of scholars in Eastern Europe which are doing it, but I think yeah. not enough in the West. Um, secondly, uh, I think you – you're right when you say it, it becomes a public policy issue. And you've already named many of the different areas where there would have to be significant public policy reforms or changes or innovations in order for countries to shift to that idea of becoming more welcoming. I mean, Canada, I think, to some extent. I, I'm, I'm a Canadian bureaucrat on leave. So I'm heartened when you uh, praise us as winners, and uh, you, it makes me look, think that the bureaucracy is actually doing a decent job, maybe. But um, if you look at the United States and issues like how sustainable health care system, the social welfare, uh, safety nets, and all of those things, there would have to be significant reforms if many countries are going to welcome this influx. And getting all those ducks in the row, I'm, I'm not entirely sure uh, we can be as optimistic that countries will say, yeah, this is the only way we can survive by bringing our, the Asian youth in. Because the Asian youth in 2050, if, if you go in your 20s now, you'll be in your 50s. The Asian youth will be in their 50s by 2050 and nearing <laughs> retirement. And there'll be many pressures that will yeah. then come to bear in these countries? Yeah. It's, um, it's a great question. So, uh, you know, I try not to generalize about all countries, like I said, getting it right. You know, there's a spectrum, and countries move up and down along that spectrum based on whether they're getting it right today. I mean, Canada could still screw up, <laughs> right? So you always have to be vigilant, right? Um, and so in terms of that, those huge sets of reforms and changes, sure. And and again, there are countries that are preparing for that, that are retooling, that are that are building the political consensus behind the, that necessity. And then there are those that are not. Um, you know, those that are going to just continue to pile on public debt and not have any way to finance it because they haven't recruited the young taxpayers and uh, homeowners and so forth. And then they're going to have to raise taxes in some way. But our taxes are already high. You cannot square the circle ultimately without doing 
without opening borders, right, quote unquote, uh, more, but doing so in a, again, in a strategic controlled, uh, you know, way. And uh, so again, I don't think that most countries are necessarily going to get it right. I, I can only name, like I said, just like I can only name a few, I can only name a few countries that have what I think is a really good, solid, smart, proactive immigration strategy. I can only name a few countries that have a really solid, you know, economic master plan. That's because there only are a few out of 200 countries. So uh, b in terms of you're tallying up just countries, then I'm no more optimistic than you are. What I am a believer in is demonstration effects, right? That next country on the horizon that's getting its act together and looking around the world and saying, what do I want to be like? Who am I going to learn from? Right? That, that, that's a huge part of my professional work is going to these countries and trying to help them figure out what their next step is. And, um, and I see a lot of hope there because they're saying, do I want to be like Italy? Do I want to be like Hungary? You know, where I'm scaring away pretty much all my young talent. Or do I want to be like Canada? Do I want to be like Singapore? You know what I mean? And so that's what I'm seeing. It's not the countries that are making the headlines at all right now or, or ever. But they're the ones that are very significant. And they're looking around the world. They view the world just like young people do almost as like a menu of, op of policy options to choose from. What educational model do I want? You know, where am I going to train my civil servants? How do I have an efficient healthcare system? How to do a pension policy? All of these kinds of things, right? That that's the real work of governance, day in, day out, all the time. Not, you know, is it Trump or DeSantis in Florida? Like, you know, I I spend all my time traveling in emerging markets, and I no one ever cares ever ever about that. All they want to know is, can I copy Singapore's, you know, urban, uh, you know, sort of public housing policy and stuff like that? The nuts and the bolts. That's what gives me hope, right? It's the it's the bureaucrats, it's the it's the public servants, the civil servants, who are out there trying to fix their make them the make next year better than the year before to make themselves a better make their country their society a better version of themselves incrementally over time, and viewing the world as a menu of options and picking the smart ones, not the dumb ones. Well, let's end on hope then. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Parag. It's so interesting to hear a little snippet of your book. I feel like we could go on for days. It's such a big topic and so interesting, and it affects all of us. So um, thank you so much for coming to Asia Society Pleasure. Hong thank Kong. You, and uh, I'm sure that we'd be happy to have you do your recommitment cer uh, ceremony <laughs> in the Hong Kong Asia Society. Um, Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Parag and uh, Diana, thank you. In fact, I think, Diana, this might be a good book for our book club. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we're in the same book club, and we're always looking for interesting books to, to, to read, and I think this might be it. But thank you all for being here. But when you were saying about uh, countries, I, it was about two years ago on this stage, we were co-hosting a program with a Finnish Council General, and they have a program you can try to be a Finnish for a day, or, you know, you people get really encouraging young people, and there were a lot of... Finnish Hong Kong young people uh, talking about their experience. So when you were saying it, just kind of like, oh yeah, many of the country uh, and and the consulate we've been working with, and you also uh, kind of just gave me an idea. A friend's daughter um, just self-published a book on digital nomad. She her family's from Michigan, and I found the book in a Hong Kong bookstore, and and I and she's living somewhere in Bali, uh, and I now have decided I'm going to invite her. She can stay, crash with me, and come and hear her experience as a digital nomad from Michigan and how she published a book and what her life is going to be like. Because I think you've touched along a lot of things that is going to be part of our future. So we will. Um, hopefully, it's not going to be another three years before we <laughs> see you, and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll you know. Uh, and in fact, you also gave me an idea. You know, Asia Society now has sixteen s cities, sixteen centers, and that one of the uh, things that we've been arguing for. Some of us is the experiences, membership experiences. So if you, I think many of you uh, are familiar and you've spoken in Switzerland, if you're here and you're going to Switzerland, you're also an Asia Society member and you can experience that. So we've been arguing for that model and hopefully with you, with your book, we're gonna make that a reality, a truly global uh, Asia Society passport membership. And that's what we're gonna aim for. So thank you all for being here and uh, it's the program's not over. We're gonna have drinks in uh, LQW room. 
Um, there are still books for sale. Uh, grab Parag for to sign the book and have further discussion. It's, I know it's Friday night, but you have nowhere better else to go than right here and, uh, and, and grab a drink and, and enjoy the uh, Friday evening with us. So thank you all for being here, and thank you both for thank a wonderful so program. Much. Thank you. Thank you.